These are great days for the university and great days for our staff. So it, it gives me huge pleasure to be able to introduce this inaugural professorial lecture for, for John Byrne. Um, I haven't known John as, as long as many of you in the audience have known him, but I've probably known you for about five or six years fairly well yeah. now, John. Um, and <laughs> one of the things that's always struck me is you always walk around the university with a smile on your face. Um, and it's a hell of a lot easier <laughs> to work with and talk to and engage um, and develop a, a personal relationship when somebody's smiling at you. So John's been one of those people who I've had the pleasure of getting to know and understand their work over the last four or five years. And it's been a real uh, joy for me, John. So thank you very much for sharing you. all your, your hard work and, and efforts uh, in, the, in the area of useful art. I'm going to read something here because there are some bits that are in French. Uh, and that's always a challenge. Um, but John is, as we all know, a professor of useful art here at LGMU, and he's a son of Liverpool. And I think that's actually important as well uh, for what we are as an institution and, and how we do our, our work and serve our communities. He's also the head of the Institute for, for Arts and Technology, and he's currently researcher and writer in residence at the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, where he's lead researcher and research editor for the Decentralising Political Economies Project and Platform, which he developed on behalf of the Whitworth Art Gallery, Gallery in collaboration with the Association of the Art Utile. Uh, that's the French pronunciation rather than the Scouse pronunciation, uh, and the City Lab. But John really does have a fantastic reputation that spreads beyond the borders of, of this city in the Northwest. Um, and his work... Uh, between 2015 and 2018 as the coordinator of the International Constituencies Research Strand and the editor of the resulting publication uh, that came from that in terms of constituent museum constellations of knowledge, politics and mediation has been really important for the field and demonstrates uh, the reach and the uh, worth of John's work internationally and also obviously the esteem in which he's held uh, around the, the world of, of art. Um, John is a great citizen. He's a good guy. He's a wonderful colleague. And he lives the LJMU values um, and, and wears the LJMU values really lightly on his shoulders. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce John, but also Alistair Hudson, who's here to uh, give him a bit of a hard time with some of the questions <laughs> he's going to ask. So looking forward to hearing it. Congratulations, John. Right, where do we start, John? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It goes back about 20 years or so, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We just found that. We just realised that before and were frightened by the no, fact. We're still in shock. <laughs> for 20, 20 years. 20 years has gone past since we, we started working together. Yeah, but it was when you came up to... I was working in Greifel Arts. Yeah. In, uh, and I'd only be, not been there a very long time. No. And you came up to give, to give a talk. Do you remember what you gave a talk about? Yeah, I gave a talk about um, I gave a talk about like rethinking art from a, a, a different um, a, a different narrative and a, and a different and a different angle. I've always been really interested in kind of undermining in a kind of a positive way assumed stereotypes of how we think. So uh, and, and I know that Adam Sutherland, who is your colleague up at Grisdale, we we met as coincidentally in the British Art <coughs> Show. And, 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 and Adam has those kind of kind of mischievous. Let's think of this another way. Set of values as well as as you do too. So we got like a house on fire. And just asked me to come up to give a talk, and, and, and things grew from there, I guess. And how was mis in those in those early formative days? How was mischievousness uh, going down in Liverpool? Or because uh, I think that comes from the culture a little bit as well, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, um, we don't kind of delve in too much into the, the, the toy box of, of, of cliché. It's one of the reasons why I, I love Liverpool, besides in the owner of the best football club in the world. So, sorry, the Spurs fans. Uh, um, um, no, the, the, seriously, I, I've, I've always found living in, in, in Liverpool a very creative thing to be part of. I've, I've always had the pleasure of 
bumping into people from all kinds of different walks of life who have a kind of creative irreverence and, and kind of want to think of doing things or look at things differently, whether that was militant politics in the 80s to the, you know, the instigation of different kind of forms of community art there that I was fortunate enough to be kind of a part of to the music scene, to to, to the kind of burgeoning and film and television industry in the early 2000s, which we were, we were, we were, we were, we were talking about. And I think like, you know, um, I think Liverpool benefits from being a port. It's always been very outward looking. And quite often people, when I started working in the cosmopolitan work of con world of contemporary art, often kind of were a bit surprised that I didn't move around the world because um, everybody did in those days after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. It became kind of par for the course to spend a few years here and spend a few years there. I think a lot of that was to do with the fact that Liverpool is a port. I was just brought up with people who'd been to see all of their lives. So everybody had always travelled all around the world and this seemed like a, a place to get things done. And I was fortunate enough to get a job here, Liverpool Poly as it was. And um, uh, I'm genuinely... Um, grateful for, for, for working here because it, it, it has always been a place that's allowed me to get mischievous projects off the ground and done and have to trust that, that, that we could think things differently and do things differently and I know colleagues and other institutions um, have often run into different kind of walls when that, that kind of left and field thinking's emerged. And it defined itself Against London in lots of ways, historically. Oh, I yeah, think that, yeah. But in absolutely. terms of the art, that filters through to the attitude yeah, in art as well, I, I think. I, I think so. I mean, like, Liverpool's always seen itself as an independent state that, that looks out across the world and has little to do with London or the Empire. Uh, and, and that kind of manifested as well. The serious side of that is, as well is, is I, I always found it easier to develop networks with people working in institutions like the Van Abbe Museum or, or the, the Reine Sophia or, 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 or Salt in Istanbul. I found, I found, I found that, that those institutions kind of celebrated ideas and possibility and were far less, far less worried about kind of invisible pecking orders. So I've naturally always found it easier to, 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 to work across the north of the UK and out and, and, and outside across, I think, which is which which, which is a, which is a sad but true. Mm -hmm. And I remember actually the first project we worked on together. Yeah, was a kind of classic case of what some people have called jackass curation, <laughs> <laughs> which was we yeah. did a project of, of we tried to run a TV channel at Greenfields. We did, we did. Uh, we did. music did. festival. Yeah, that was that that was that was that was great fun. Um, we managed to develop a project in collaboration with with you know the the, the dance music company. And um, um, thanks to um, having kind of like um, I, I'd known James Barton for for several years, and he was very interested in sort of to try to do things differently, and and I introduced. James Barton and Creative Alistair and, and Adam, and we concocted an idea um, to to produce a kind of an alternative uh, online short-lived pop-up TV company that would just last for the duration of one of the Creamfields festivals, and would recruit some young artists and filmmakers to kind of make quick fire uh, pieces of, of film. And we also got some um, notable bits of. Um, contemporary art video shown on the, the big screen behind the main stage um, as well, much to people's surprise when they saw people trampolining in tutus in between in between Creamfield sets. Um, uh, and it was it was kind of it was just such an overwhelming and difficult thing to do, but it was really, really interesting because I think I think looking back on it, it's one of those things that just if you want to do something that kind of falls in between the cracks, that kind of fell between every every crack, really. 
in, in terms of like what I mean by that is I've always been interested like you know when like the, there are established ways of looking at the world and often we look at interdisciplinary and transdisciplinarity or however you want to describe it as relationships between those existing models um, there's cracks in between those models that, that kind of where things happen and you can't kind of see them unless you look at them, them in a different way and from a different point of view and, and, and that project wonderfully kind of fell in between every everyone it kind of Including everybody at Creamfield. <laughs> yeah. What year was it? Oh, it was, it was 2005, six, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's how hazy my memory is. But we just realised we've got, you know, we've got all of these, we've got these Uber passes so we could go absolutely anywhere, which, which the younger artists loved. You know, they, they just abandoned filmmaking and just went to, <laughs> went to the, uh, the sort of the, uh, the after stage tents. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, but, but seriously, it was kind of interesting as well because it was just so physically overwhelming in terms of size. Um, uh, one of the young artists spent ages making um, a kind of castle that was going to be graffiti that would sit next to Radio 1. Um, uh, live broadcast bus, and we went through all. It was actually Pablo Bronstein. It was a Pablo Bronstein, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I, 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 we 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 took it took so long to 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 get it past health and safety, because um, I mean, if you think university health and safety is strict when you're doing something that that's live with hundreds of thousands of people there, it, it's beyond. And uh, there's, a, there's a kind of an anecdote about that as well, which maybe will that, that that's for that, that's for another another day. But um, um, when it actually <coughs> happened, um, after all of this effort and all of this ambition, we just realised how small the structure was <laughs> in comparison to cream fields. Well, it actually actually tiny. became the garden shed. Yeah, Christ, the garden shed. Yeah, yeah, and and and. and, and Part of the chicken shed. Yeah, that's well. correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well. So, so it was kind of all kind of issues of scale and expectations and the impact you think that you can have, kind of ideologically and physically as well. When after all of this effort, it happened. There was a kind of there was just this overwhelming, wonderfully overwhelming experience of hundreds of thousands of trashed music lovers dancing for a weekend and people trying to. To, but, to but, quick see off <coughs> do art in the middle of it. But I think, the, in a way, some of the failures of it, are, as always, are the, are the formative experiences. Yeah. So I remember trying to film and do vox pop interviews with raver families who would just gurn relentlessly into the camera lens. So it became actually impossible to make a TV yeah. any content at all because everybody just gurned at the camera. And I think after about five hours of this, Despite having offers to go backstage with Kasabian, we went to your house to watch Match of the Day with the Curry. We did, yeah, we did. It was a good curry as well. That is that. <laughs> yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a kind of. But it was a really interesting. It was a really interesting entry into trying to operate in a hybrid manner with with people and institutions who were really willing to do so, and, and learning lots of lessons about where where your own kind of ideas sat and where your expectations might be challenged and, and where the kind of assumptions that you make might not have the kind of traction that you you, you, you thought they would be. It was really interesting. Um, but, but it highlights as well, I think, it, it's what happens when you try to do art in a, in a defined sense yeah. in an environment that is oblivious to that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was certainly a kind of a formative <coughs> experience thinking that transition that we became interested in and kind of a, a you know a core part of in that kind of bubbling set of discussions and ideas about useful art and about kind of trying to do things that might be measured in terms of use value rather than aesthetic value and might kind of challenge kind of it was a real kind of underscoring of how many assumptions that the art design world can be riddled with which are fine but what happens when they they hit the traction of another in, in a real sense and, 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 that, and that that's not a problem it's actually really interesting 
uh, it, it's the, the it, you know kind of things can be done and fun can be had. And that led in a way that but that segued into I think the next project that we worked on with between us at LGMU, which was the, the Tate Show, Art Turning yeah. Left, yeah. which was like the antithesis in a way, because that was, in a way it was kind of inserting non-art activities into an artistic field. Yeah, no, that was that was that was that was really interesting. There was a there was a an exhibition at, at, at Liverpool Tate called Art Turning Left that the then director Francesco Manicorda um, developed in relationship with with LGMU. And as part of that, and after discussions with, with Francesco, who's very forward thinking, he was keen on having um, a, an Office of Useful Art as part of the exhibition. And the Office of Useful Art was literally an open space. Was lit that um, um, uh, Alistair had had, it had developed a prototype version of this for the Sao Paulo Biennial in 2010. And, and it was literally, a, it was just a space that you could go into inside a museum and, and, and gallery and, and, and do what you wanted to do. The whole idea was you could use that space to, to, to make what you wanted to happen, happen. And that was quite difficult as well, because however, however much Francesco wanted that to work, it still hit the kind of invisible barriers of the, the curatorial systems that inhered in, 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 in Tate Liverpool, but nevertheless offered a a couple of months of people being able to go into a space in which they would not normally be able to do anything besides look or listen and it enabled them to have a voice and to discuss things and to think things differently and to do things differently and Francesco was fabulous as well we were able to do some teaching there and he was like really open so some of our students could, could ask for um, uh, pictures and images that the, the Tato and the Francesco would make sure they were just put on the wall of the Office of Useful Arts so they could chat about them rather than not even see, see them on slides, which was, which, which, which was, which, which, which was, was quite brilliant. And I think in, it, it, that actually kick-started the chain of events that, that um, um, led to further development of the Tate, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think there was a, a bit of a think tank after that at Tate that, yeah. that ended in Tate Exchange, I yeah. think. Absolutely, it, 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 it did. Uh, we, were, we were part of those, those discussions, but it was very interesting that the 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 tape really wanted to exploit the possibilities, but was still limited um, in ways that operate beyond the individuals by some of their kind of paradigmatic outlooks. Really, was it? So the Tate Exchange was wonderful but became something that was still nevertheless curated. You had to make an application and see if it would be expected. And people wanted to put things in Tate Exchange because it was part of Tate, which is fine. And we, which kind of ran counter to that ethos of the of, you know, the offices of useful art, which is that anybody could just come in and do stuff because they might meet people who they've never met before and, and find different ways of addressing social problems and issues. Which was I know much more interesting to, to us and kind of behind you know your, uh, your championing of, of, of assemble in the in the 2015 Taylor Prize a, a couple of years later. But then it was interesting because you then took you then had that conversation with the Granby Four Streets project yeah. here in Liverpool. Yeah. Where actually rather than this this concept of an, for example an art this archive of art material of useful art. Um, was obviously it was, the, the idea was it was a kind of database of ideas that you could yeah. like, borrow and steal from. Yeah. And, and yeah. In, in institutional settings like Tate, it was always a bit. It fell into being an archive display, yeah. or in, 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 yeah. in, in, in you, it, it, it didn't have a way in life because these institutions are not in life in the same way. But then you had that conversation with Granby Four Streets, and I think that was that was quite a significant change it, it, for you. It was. Uh, I think that was that was a really interesting kind of d discovery because that was that was in and around as well. We we, we set up a, a pop up a pop up office of useful art in in the exhibition research um, gallery space in, in in the art school. It was, it was only for two weeks, but that kind of coincided with um, the 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 launch of it was it was the visible award mm. that happened in. Uh, which is a socially engaged kind of 
um, uh, practice um, event, I suppose, in, in which a short-listed set of socially engaged practices um, were voted for by people who literally came along to Liverpool Town Hall, so it was open to the public. Uh, Francesco Rancord, again, was really, really, really helpful with that. But um, we we set that up in this association of party to your archive, and we did what you usually do, which is print off a set of A3s and put them on the wall. And, and my kind of wonderful and long suffering partner, see that usually help me kind of put them on the wall. But what we noticed, because we got a door open to the gallery space that wasn't then usually open, so just people who wouldn't usually come into the art school came in, and we noticed that. Well, you know, when people move into galleries and they're not used to that they go and read the stuff next to the pictures? It's kind of a default, isn't it? I mean, I do it. And they went along to see these things on the wall, which are just incredibly inventive projects. And they'd start reading them. And literally, we started to count after they'd read three or four, they would turn around and say, is this art? This is amazing. And it started to kind of dawn on us when we talked to Grammy Four Streets as well, that as Alistair said, that rather than this being an archive of of good art that was socially engaged practice. It was actually a, it was actually a recipe book of, of things that people could take from and mix and match in order to to address local social problems artfully. And uh, and Grammy Four Streets picked that up, and we were able to open up a, an association of uh, art a util uh, office um, uh, in Granby for. Um, for the end of the year in, in an old barber shop it was, it was disused. Um, and that was great. That was that kind of that 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 really worked. I mean again people came in and, and, and you know and, and, and looked at it and took and drew influence from it and, and assembly who were operating there at the time were were you know very, very open to that and very very helpful with that and just like helped to um help 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 to this course happen. So yeah, it was really it, it, it was a really uh, it was a really interesting moment having worked in community based art and, and kind of the contemporary art world before. It was one of the first times I, I kind of experienced a very excited and self motivated community just take things up for themselves and to use them and to make things happen without the guidance of others. And it was quite 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 a game changer, I think, for me that. And then a lot of this, because it's interesting, because part of part of the work that, you know that we did here, yeah. Tate, but also Granby, obviously all this work that we were doing was part of this wider constellation of projects yeah. with the International yeah, Museums yeah. Confederation in yeah. Europe, which is sort of these yeah. cluster of slightly left of field thinking, but major institutions in Europe. Who were looking for new ways of learning about how they might change museums, how they might yeah. change their uh, institutional status, yeah. the, the way they operate, and, and also like like like-minded um, institutions, I would say, who who were, you know, you, you described tried to be a little bit more mischievous yeah. and effective yeah, in yeah. the way they work, and yeah. so uh, you know that all that all those little stories yeah. then start to have an effect on a, on a wider. Um, trajectory, I think, for, for European museums in particular, so that's yeah. really been going on for about ten years now. No, no, for sure. It's like we, we've often thought kind of ways to describe how that that might happen. It's like um, um, you know when you, for me, it's like when you kind of I've only seen it in, in life once or twice. But you know, like those wonderful images of murmurations of swallows. It kind of seems like all of these communities and ideas kind of sort of somehow in different disparate ways join together to make a kind of concatenation of them as no one idea or one project is big or massive or paradigmatic but they're they're all kind of rhizomatically linked by a kind of a, a will to kind of recoup some re recoup some of the possibilities of being creative and being human in, in, in the face of a a culture which, you know, let, let, let's face it, is kind of instrumental, instrumentalising us all until there's, there's nothing left and, and putting a price on everything. Mm. It, it, it allowed people to kind of say, well, you know, 
it's not as simple as, as, as art being art and promising some kind of future beyond this catastrophe um, or this catastrophe being different from art. It's lots of the operational systems of neoliberalism have, have stolen and repaired with some of the most effective ideas from the art world, you know, motivation, thinking outside of the box. It's, it's, you know, they're the explanations for why innovation, kind of innovation why, why, why people work in Silicon Valley or why people should put up with a zero on a contract for Uber. Um, it, it, they're the same rhetorics and, and, and maybe a more complex and sufficient way of looking at it is to say well well, they, they aren't opposites we're just in a much more asymmetrical culture and what we want to do is to, to rescue and recoup and take some of those systems back you know, some, 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 some ways of, of networking and working together that now seem paradigmatically to be part of a culture that alienates us from each other are actually also ways that we could work together to produce things very, very differently and very, very, very well. And I think useful art is a way of being able to see that again, to, to kind of think that use value is actually really important because it's just about being social and, 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 and finding ways and means to work together in small ways that add up to much bigger movements to, to kind of reclaim what's been taken and, 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 and lost. Um, um, I, I suppose. And a very good example of that, very quickly, uh, Alice is alluding to the, the, uh, the uses of art, the legacies of, of 1848 and, and 1989 project that we did with Linter National, it's been a five year project. Literally in our first meeting, we were talking to some of the mediation departments in the Reign of Sophia, and, and what struck both Alistair and I, because you know, everybody saw them at the time as like the best mediation department of one of the, the paradigmatic museums and galleries in the world, is they were dissatisfied with what they did, which which was kind of lovely. It's like, it's not enough. But if I remember rightly, yeah. there were all these you know, institutions from around Europe, and they'd all planned out a yeah. three, four year EU million or so funded EU project with exhibitions and publications, and all this work. And then but there was no planned activity for mediation or education yeah. in this as well. And it was really only that meeting we ended up in a sort of, you know, the, the workshop group mediation. on the mediation, which is basically all the mediators dumped in a room yeah, yeah. <laughs> with nothing to do and saying, yeah. well, what can we do? But then that, that interestingly then became the main focus of the project. It, it, it did. And, and, and led to the, uh, you know, the, the publication, Constituent Museum. No, it was, it was, it was, again, it, it was, it was a wonderful moment. It was real privilege to be able to work with people who are quizzical and operating on, on that kind of, of level. And one of the things that these kind of, um, the, you know, these, these colleagues were saying is that no matter how many communities we work with, no matter what we publish, no matter what we do in, 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 in the reign of sphere, um, which is seen as a kind of a paradigmatic way forward. It's one way broadcast. This isn't changing the operating systems of the main sphere at all. We still got this hierarchical idea that art's art, and uh, it should kind of be then translated into various languages so different people can understand it and kind of get on board with what art is in the capital A. And what we decided was that a different way of playing that was to try to to think of how um, an institution, whether it's a museum or a gallery or even something like a, a, a university, might perceive itself as being one constituent amongst many fluid constituencies that change and relate to each other in order to make things happen. And if that was the case, then museums and galleries and, and institutions would have to begin to think of ways in which their operating systems became much more much less hierarchical and much more flattened out and, and, and open to processes of change and becoming that were kind of often beyond the way they thought, which is quite quite a scary thing to do. You know, but there's some way that there's some ways in which you can work that, that hover between things always staying as they are or some ridiculous notion of simply handing the keys over to somebody else and saying the game's up. How, how do you work together to map new trajectories to change and, and, and to become something other than, than you can imagine as yourself? 
I think. And, and, and I think what's wonderful about that project is, is there were so many kind of um, exciting people who wanted to participate in in kind of to do, doing that. And, and the other thing about that project is we envisaged the book that came out of it not as a usual publication, but as a kind of as a kind of a guidebook. Really, it's something that Alistair had a, a big input into that that could be read the other way around and had lots of small scale evidence of projects that people could then pick up and use in, in institutions across the world to try and change something themselves to kind of do things differently and however it might suit their community or their their agencies or their institution so that became a, a, again a, another rich building on that kind of those ideas that that kind of began to emerge with the office of useful art ground before street i think yeah and then yeah and i'm just wondering away what what those experiences have had on how you teach at the art school because on the one hand you're you're you're, you are someone operating between systems as well, yourself. Yeah. Or somebody, uh, I'm just wondering, reflecting back, whether uh, how that's changed about the way you teach, the way you uh, operate within this institution, which is primarily a teaching institution or research institution, I, when, when you're yeah. out there in the world doing stuff. Yeah. I think, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a kind of a, a couple of answers to that. The, the first is that the, there's, the, the longer I've been doing it, and the kind of the, the, the let's face it, the older I'm getting, um, uh, the more I want to kind of write and communicate it in a way that can that can open up ideas to a much broader multiplicity of audiences, so they can feel that they have the possibility of using art as a tool for social change themselves, and working with people who are willing to kind of begin to kind of rethink the game so that becomes a possibility. Now I think but at the other end of that, one of the simple things, it, it's been several um, um, years since I, I was I was working on, on the, the fine art programme and I used to do some of the history and theory with the, the fine art students and that was, um, I, I, I you have a culprit there. You were, you were, you were, you were the elder. <laughs> we decided to uh, to move away from kind of. There was this kind of assumption that what you should do is give people the kind of the the isms, building blocks of a history and theory, which they could then go away and do something with. And what that tended to do was just daunt people and, and daunt students who either liked doing that kind of thing or didn't. So instead of that. <laughs> I started kind of teaching that alternative history, which was, well, actually the way we look at art's only 200 years old, you know? People in the 1700s didn't kind of think of having an aesthetic experience in front of a painting in a museum or gallery that was public because none of that existed. And you, there weren't exhibitions. No, which, which is so easy to prove. and and. and and, and once you started talking like that, because students are wonderful, they're creative, they're impish, they want to do things differently. Once that kind of just, you know, we, 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 we all talked about it, once, once that realisation is there, it's not, like, it's not the end of the world, it's actually really empowering. So then these wonderful students can say, actually we can do this differently. It doesn't have to always stay the same, we can contribute to kind of rewriting and remaking and reproducing this in, in, in our own ways, however modest. Um, and um, I think you know that's that's you know as 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 my career has evolved and I've become more and more um, in, involved in, in in research. I think there's you know there's obviously um, institutional uh, UK wide um, um, measures and checks and balances about what counts as research and what doesn't. And a, a light bulb that went on for me. That, 10 or so years ago with the help of some colleagues was I didn't have to change what I did which didn't kind of fit into an easily recognisable notion of publishable research. I just had to do that research in a way which put up kind of signposts and flagpoles which would en enable it to be recognised as such uh, and to still move towards those ideas and forms of social change and engagement because 
because kind of both staff and students are, 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 are alike, I think, mm -hmm. can, can, can celebrate being in a, in, in a university. And I, I really believe this, like ours, which gives us the opportunity to, to play, should we wish to, and to challenge and to think of ways of doing things differently and otherwise. You know, and you, you, you can do that in a way which has a, an international impact. Um, do that in, in, in a way which, which leads to recognisable and impactful publications. Um, I, I, I go about it by trying to be useful and having an impact rather than thinking of, oh, I need to do something which is seen as good research. If you put the horse back in front of the car, you can, you, the, the, the ecology shifts, I think, and, and you know, with the, what's happening with the, the School of Art and Design and the Liverpool Screen School and what we've been trying to do over the last couple of years with the Institute of Art and Technology, it's slowly starting to, 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 to work that way and starting to, we were talking about this the other day, Mark Wright, who's in the audience, is, is kind of part of that steering committee, is planning, as, as, as in Rachel McLean, who's, who's here, we're, we're, we're starting to generate plans which will uh, allow for more, um, more voices to come through, more diversity to become part of the research, for the research to kind of mm -hmm. open up different pathways and to happen in different ways. Um, and, and, but those things take time. It's a kind of an ecology that you, you foster. <coughs> Dominic Wilkinson, who's also so here, and, and, and Ian Root, who's I mean, the director, we recognise that these things are, are, are systemic and incremental changes, rather like those concatenations of swallows, that when enough people are interested, they can do their own thing, but a global change starts to happen because of that, that ecology and ecosystem. Um, I think, which means that people can still do their own stuff, but that it kind of begins to build into a way of looking and a way of seeing and a way of doing that has a has an international impact. So, just pretending nobody from the higher echelons of the university is watching, if you had your mischievous evil way <laughs> with the art school, where would it go? <laughs> if I had my evil mischievous way with the art school, I think it would go in the way it's it's already started to move, and I think in the way in which art and design schools will probably evolve anyway I, I i think i think that the art and design schools of the future uh, will be much more about enabling and facilitating their students to um, have the skills to operate flexibly in and across disciplines and find those cracks and be creative in ways that have real world impacts, whether that's socially or, or, or economic, whether that's working with industry or working with communities. And that's a political imperative because if we don't keep nurturing that possibility to creatively use what's there, whether that's the technologies around us, whether that's the ways of communicating with each other, whether that's thinking creative, creatively, we will just continually become financialized memes within a, a soulless global neoliberalism. So I think in, in, in a way what art schools can do and become is, is hugely impactful and meaningful. I really do think that, that they, they, they still offer the bridge between um, being able to help shift and change the real world economies that we are all part of, whether we like it or not, and the kind of ideas that can can develop from from those engagements that are about being human, being ethical, working and living in a way that's sufficient for our ours and each other's um, uh, health and well-being. Yeah, I, I, I've been talking with my new hat on to lots of kind of big tech companies and yes, innovation companies and technologists and people like this and. It's interesting now, and I think it's changed from even 10 years ago, but now they want to work with artists yeah. or they want to work with artistic thinking. I think part of it is also comes through that story you pertain to, which is like that, that story from the, you know, the, the hippie outsiders of the 1960s yeah. finding their way through 
you know, from being the outsiders to being the insiders and the nerds in control. And now, <coughs> you know, we now have this, this kind of these huge beer moths. But what's interesting for me is that is they're now demanding this. They've realized that they've been the nerds in the room for too long. Yeah. And they don't want necessarily just to have what they do extracted by political power. Mm. They actually do have good intention a lot yeah. of the time, but they don't know how, they don't know which way to go. But they see somehow working with art ideas or art-like ideas and artists and being playful in the same way that you refer to being playful. Yeah. As, 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 a, as another route they could take, take technology down. Yeah in order for it to do those things you talked about. So I think it's an interesting moment now where it used to, in a way, we talked a lot about the ground up. We talked yeah. about, you know, from left field. We talked about this, this rise from somewhere, but it always hits, yeah. hits the ceiling it's somewhere. Yeah. But it seems to me there's an opportunity now for, for, for these two worlds of the different cosmoses to join, to join together. Yeah. So it may, maybe no, I, I, so the, does the yeah. role of the art school fit there somewhere? I I I believe it. I believe it does. I, I believe that that's an increasingly um, open space within which art and design schools, whether it's here at LGA and you, and that's what literally we're, we're trying to do, or or, or, or across Europe and the global south can can, can do. I think that 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 requirement almost to fill a void which is opening between kind of the possibilities that different forms of communication and technology provide and the uh, social and ethical uses can 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 be filled with with experimental inventive creative thinking which, which, which is which is which is based around which is based around the social rather than the endless extraction of, of, of monetary value and, and, and the things don't have to be mutually exclusive. I think we could we could play a big role in escaping the gravity of those. It's again, it's like art, non-art, escaping the gravity of those now quite useless binary discussions about well, you know, if it's utilitarian, it's not art, and if it's art, it's protecting us from these nasty things. And if it's, a, it's it, 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 that just doesn't hold water anymore. <coughs> You know the, the 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 whole territory's moved on, and I think it's it's it, 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 it universities and, and art schools can play a big role in equipping their students and their staff to play major roles in reclaiming those 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 debates and those possibilities and those ways of working that can can return a, a meaningfulness and, and and a humanity to how we use our technologies and, and, and produce them to be Marxist, reproduce ourselves in the future, which, which is linked to ecology and, 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 and how we protect our future and live otherwise. And that connects a little bit to the other project we worked on more recently, which was the Economics the Blockbuster project. Yes, yes. Talking of changing the world. <laughs> changing the world, yeah. Um, um, I mean, Economics the Blockbuster was a, an exhibition which was instigated by Alistair Woodson while he was the uh, the director of the Whitworth uh, uh, um, Art Gallery and was, was developed by, by Poppy Bowers, who's um, I'm really happy he's very wanted to join us and Alessandra Sobiotti, our, 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 our new doctor, um, 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 worked on too. And that was a, that was a really interesting um, testing ground, really, I think, wasn't it? To, to, try, to, to try to make an exhibition in a museum and gallery that has a, a does a kind of thing and has a reputation in a way that that kind of not just bridged the gap but did the best of both worlds. It presented an interesting exhibition but also laid out a series of possibilities. So as we relentlessly kept saying, an audience could come through the door and leave the exhibition rethinking what the economy is. And having much more of an idea that economics isn't simply money and it's quite a complex thing that you can join in. It's not just something that's always being done on to you, although these days it, 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 it is more often than not. Um, but that also kind of allowed people to kind of work on projects over a couple of years that would lead to, to possible 
spurred the projects that had a real way of longevity and, and impact which, which has happened. So it's really a really interesting and kind of brave way of, of, of rethinking how we can use the best of what we have to begin to do something differently. Um, I think and to kind of move that move, move that dial towards towards the constituents towards use value. Talking of getting the best use of what we have, I think I don't know how long we have in total, but yeah. uh, I thought maybe it's time uh, to open up some questions. Yeah. To you. Really. Okay. Sorry, the Of, of, of swallows is, is to work together in ways to kind of 
continually erode those expectations so so art and living creatively together can become something different that begins to evade that capture that government capture that we're talking about at the moment is just too easy that, that must be, and, and it, it's 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 an impossible thing to, to answer straight up. but i've thought about it myself it's uh, it, it, the fact that that's so possible kind of points to some of the flaws and fishes in the in the kind of art world that we have at the moment, how it's been hijacked already effectively by neoliberalism. I might begin, I don't know what they are, to point to ways that we might need to rethink our game. I think that's what's so disturbing that the art forum left so various other openness in Berlin. What, what, what was so sad about it in some of the cases the artists made me say that these art institutions and museums and galleries around the world have spent the last five years with us in the wake of Black Lives Matter or pointing to atrocities in Ukraine and taking an ethical stance on them, decolonizing, diversifying, being invested in social justice and climate justice. And yet, suddenly, you know, there is a silence and there is a censorship and there are laws mobilizing to further sort of um, crack down on, on that. And, and to not even, not even take, I'm not even really talking about art that's, you know, explicitly political. It's literally artists who would say, yeah. along with the UN, Maybe we shouldn't all be witnessing genocide, and that in itself has been enough for artists to be dropped from exhibitions and shows and document. Um, so just yeah, and all the other thing I was going to say is that some of the stuff we're talking about. I mean, the last documenta, the you know the sort of twenty two edition that we saw, is a is a kind of brilliant sort of manifestation of that sort of a model. I think of what happens if you do say, well, let's think we think this a little bit. I mean, it was so heavily criticised because of a few unfortunate kind of scandals, but. It really did shake up that kind of like idea of, mm. you know, what can art do? And one of the most wonderful things about it, I took the take team over that when, when it was first over was it, it was like it was engaging local communities and it was all about making as opposed to and that's the sort of utopian sort of thinker in me that clings to that kind of model. But I do think we are in unprecedented times in terms of where art is and what it can do. So but then it maybe needs unprecedented mm -hmm. strategies and tactics. Mm -hmm. And ways of operating, and I think that's you know a lot of what John's articulated tonight as well is that, that things are changing so fast, you know that, that when we talk about this, accept you know, I mean I wouldn't say acceptance, but the the mainstreaming of these ideas that you know twenty years ago people would literally berate you and say this is really not art, you cannot do this, coming into yeah. coming into the picture manifesting. Projects that you see, you know, like a documenta. Mm. It's happened. It's happened, happened over a long, a relatively long period of time. But the the, the speed of change now requires even even more yeah, fleet yeah. of foot thinking. I think yeah. and thinking outside of the expectations of what an artist is or how they say what they say or how they do what they do. Mm. No, I, I I I'd agree. I, I, when we were lucky enough to be invited by the Association of Art Therapy Deal to to kind of have a, a series of discussions as part of the documenter in the the Instar Tammy and Bigger's Instar installation. And and um, the philosopher Stephen Wright has written a lot about use and, and has a wonderfully enviably eloquent turn of phrase. Um, just started the whole proceedings by by saying this beautiful phrase. He just looked around and said, I, I think this is probably the moment where where art has potentially slipped its mooring. And, and, and that will that will be counteracted by people who just do not want it in any way, shape, or form to slip its mooring and, and help us to explore new territories. And, and there's no simple answer to what you're saying besides the fact that, that you also called it a useful clusterfuck. <laughs> it is as well. It is as well. Yeah, it's uh, you know that that kind of asymmetric environment that that we are now in is is an existential struggle mm. and there's no escaping from that and, and we have to partake in it somewhere shape or form but it's a real legal political one as well as nice oh gosh yeah yeah mm. yeah that's kind of yeah how it christian here sorry yeah hi um just to say congratulations on your professorship you must have worked really hard um and i've really enjoyed a lot of the things you've said i love the metaphor of the starlings, the murmuration of starlings, which beautifully encompasses 
the individual and the collective, and also the speed of movement needed in these Christ awful times that are so um, desperate for so many people, artists or not. And I think the fact artists are being silent is a great recognition of the power of artists, so they would not bother to silence us. So, um, but I also think that. Um, the art of witnessing our times, even if it's blank spaces as they did in South African newspapers when they were censored, and they just put a blank space where that piece was. You know, we can also act in these ways. We're not orphans. Um, we, we can learn from those who've gone before, who've been oppressed, who've been silenced, who've been X'd out, written out, erased. Um, so that murmuration spreads across generations and time as well as boundaries. But I just want to say well done for becoming a professor. Just on that again. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it and I feel I'm going to go away empowered. <laughs> so, Thank you. Great. That's a win. Can I, sorry, this is, this is Mandy Cove, who's just got a funded PhD with us in a case anybody's wanted. Oh, yeah. so, um, so, yes. Congratulations. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very prolific and well-published writer. Um, I, I just want to pick up on what you said about research, because this is sort of honey to my ears, if that's not a mixed metaphor at the end of a, a, a long day. Um, I think sometimes, well, I, no, I would say sometimes, I think a lot of the time in university, we write in a language that is excluding. Mm, yeah. And I think what you were saying then about doing your research, but finding ways to sort of meet the parameters of the research councils. I sort of think we need to knock those boundaries down a little bit more, and the walls of the university need to be more permeable, yeah. because otherwise we have the academy as gatekeepers, yeah. and uh, the language we use in our writing as excluding, and that's not useful to anyone, and we just end up talking to the same small group of people, and it becomes a very elitist, environment and that's absolutely the opposite of what you're working towards so it was just really interesting to hear that and I just wonder how we can do more of that and break down those barriers particularly around language I think there's that I, 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 I completely agree I was lucky enough to be part of a, a, an online debate which was set up by somebody who Poppy introduced me to by Poppy mm -hmm. Callahan um, who who kind of works very closely with, with the Zapatista movement, and um, we had this kind of online discussion a couple of years ago, kind of that like, went on for a, a, a day, and it was really interesting. It was this fissure that started to open between really really cool and lovely academics who were primarily Western, who increasingly as they got tired said, "Well, I'm frustrated, and the state is to blame for anything, and you'll never change anything." And kind of people from um, the other side of the tracks, some leading academics like Fred Moore, uh, uh, but people from the Global South who were saying, well, there must be something that we can do tomorrow. And, and kind of one of the things that somebody suggested, which was really easy, was like, you know, what if we all left this meeting today and decided that in any of the courses that we write, just one of the modules would make it a responsibility for students to work with their constituents. Mm. Just and if everybody did that, then then relays would happen, or unexpected meetings would begin to happen, and things would would, would 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 work differently. And I think I think there probably are tactical day-to-day -day things that creative people like us could get together and think of that we could begin to implement relatively quickly, which are modest and doable and, and interesting uh, and achievable, however stretched we all, all are at the moment, which, which, would, which would open those kind of channels a bit. So it's unfortunate Alessandra had to to, to move away because her, her PhD, which she's just finished, was on, on, on hacking education institutions. And, and that was very much not about like how can people come in and steal the stuff. It's just it's 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 just the way institutions develop, similar to universities, similar to, they're all always full of really great people, but the institution has over a couple of hundred years become such that it's difficult to jailbreak yourself. 
you know, it, and there, there must be kind of tactical small ways in which we can hack what we do. Uh, and, and, you know, and that, that already goes on. You know, like the great work that you do is the Fab Lab and these things that you know, that all of the programs and courses do. But there must be ways of, of, of doing that that more. You know, as, as 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 ways of making it possible for people to get five four O levels in in in, in, in Bootle in the nineteen eighties and still end up a professor somehow. <laughs> you know, so. Well, on that call to arms, John. That's I think that's our hour, but we can carry on afterwards. I want I want to reiterate congratulations yeah. to you, John, for your Thank professorship, you. and I'm I'm. So happy you've remained a Liverpudlian and rooted in Liverpool because the world needs people who are rooted in places like this in order to shape the world differently. And uh, all my colleagues at ZKM said, oh, is it that guy with a funny accent we saw at Documenta <laughs> <laughs> that we couldn't understand? <laughs> yeah, he needs a translator. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. And I think we can have continue afterwards. <laughs>